welcome to them. Um, can I, um, first of all, thank um, Anton um, and Wazim. Wazim is our host today, and Anton is the architect of a series of informal talks at, um, at Stanhill. This is the second of that series. Um, Professor Gibson um, from the Maths Department at Cambridge was our kick-off speaker, a very entertaining, discursive journey along the highways and byways of high theology. Um, and that was a few weeks ago. And uh, this is the second um, of the talks. And I'm told the third will be um, drama and literature. Or is it just drama, Anton? Uh, just drama. Just drama. Acting drama? <laughs> yeah. Or the art of writing drama. No, no, acting drama. The acting, right? So we're going to, we're going to we're, acting's coming up, much to Franz's amusement. In fact, it's a normal day at Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you, Anton, for organising and uh, making this happen. And thank you, Wazim, for allowing all of these people into the Stanhill office and feeding and watering them. Um, let me also reassure all of you that this is a very very gentle, non-rigorous introduction. Um, when I use the word rigorous, I mean in a technical sense. It's, it's not at all mathematical. And if at any point in this next half an hour, 45 minutes, I put somebody off or say something which can't be easily understood, then I will have failed in my objective. It, it, it is my view that quantum physics and quantum mechanics can be understood by anybody and uh, today's going to be uh, the test of that. But I'm pretty confident that we can um, at least get through the presentation and hopefully provide uh, those of you who are specialists uh, with a feel for a subject that is of great importance. Um, having said that, I'm afraid, despite my best efforts and Anton's best efforts, we do have a spattering of specialists here that have somehow um, gone in through the door uh, Dan over there actually teaches theoretical physics at Cambridge, um, so I'm not quite sure what he's doing here. <laughs> 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 up on you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Dan's a very dutiful young colleague of mine at Cambridge Quantum, so I suspect he's showing his support for his Terrasval boss. Um, thank you, Dan, for coming. And Dan's actually going to say something uh, at one point in the video. Uh, we also have, um, dare I say, from the dark side, uh, physics graduate, which is Eddie over here, who's keeping very quiet. Um, and of course, um, we have Professor Gibson from Cambridge. Um, but um, at some point, I think we're going to have Simone here, whose credentials in the subject um, would be impossible for me to recount. Um, in his stead, his wife is here, so uh, <laughs> but she's not a physicist. And Charles is here. Hi, Charles. Hi. Um, so welcome, all of you. And as I say, I think it will be an extremely general introduction to, uh, to the subject. Um, what does gentle mean? It means that we're not going to have any of this rubbish on here. Um, so there'll be no equations and there won't be any drawings, uh, or certainly not diagrams that are meant to confuse rather than explain. The issue that one faces when uh, trying to address a subject like this is that it is shrouded in some degree of mystery, and that mystery is um, is one that confounds pretty much anybody who's on the outside. I think the typical um, response of people who are not specialists in either physics or mathematics is when they hear the word quantum physics or quantum mechanics or theoretical physics, um, they do become slightly intimidated, and rightly so. It is a subject that um, doesn't wear its uh, complexity very lightly. However, there is a flip side to the coin, which is that for the last hundred and odd years, it's one of the most thoroughly researched subjects in, actually, one of the, full stop, one of the most thoroughly researched subjects. And that means that we today stand on the shoulders of many great scholars um, who have researched this subject. And the definition of a great scholar is he makes things accessible to people. He doesn't have to take any kind of 
uh, prisoners when talking to his peers, but when talking to people who aren't specialists, he can make the most complex things straightforward. So in what I'm about to present, um, I'm standing on their shoulders. And there's nothing that I'm about to say which um, I either the author of um, or have been um, creating. All I'm doing is taking the ideas of some fantastic people who've made theoretical physics very accessible to the layperson. A uh, principal amongst those great scientists is uh, Richard Feynman, uh, who's my personal favourite. And so if you are inspired at the end of this talk to learn more, then all you need to do is get online and listen to what uh, Dick Feynman had to say about the subject. And he's got one or two successors, the most uh, noted of which is uh, Lenny Suskind um, at Caltech. Um, and there are YouTube videos galore on every aspect of what I'm about to, to, to offer. Of course, like any specialization, um, physics has its own language, but so does everything else. So music has its language. <coughs> we all enjoy music, um, but of course not all of us can read music, even fewer of us can play music. Um, we have one or two bankers who don't want to be identified in this room, but uh, they have their own language. Um, and. Um, of course, I, some of you know I used to live in Korea, and I learned Korean, and Korean has its own language, which is this one that says Hangul. Um, I can't read or write very much now, but um, everything has its language. Um, that should be no surprise. And the translation of that language into one that we all understand is what I'm going to try and do today. And it's actually a lot easier than if I were to try and teach you well, I wouldn't be qualified to teach you any of these subjects, um, either Russian or, well, French. We have Charles here. Charles can it. <laughs> but, but at least in theoretical physics, it's a lot easier to translate some of these concepts into everyday language than it would be for us to translate a knowledge of some of these subjects into everyday language. Well, some of us still don't know what the banking terms are. <laughs> but um, that was not a joke. Um, <laughs> Before we um, get too far into the subject, uh, one caveat, this is often commented upon. Richard Feynman was a Nobel Prize winner, um, a real father of physics in, in the modern era, and he said that if you meet anyone who claims to have understood quantum mechanics, then you have met a liar. <laughs> and it's a slightly uh, tongue-in-cheek comment, but it, it's a very true comment. Theoretical physics, uh, for reasons which certainly by the end of the next 20-30 minutes hopefully you will appreciate is a subject where the boundary has yet to be reached. We think we understand what we understand and can translate what we understand into a language but do we really understand that universe which is the infinitesimal? And the answer is no, we don't. There are uncertainties for reasons which are very, very obvious and I think uh, one of the great quests of, 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 of science over the last 40 years is that we are pushing on those boundaries, but we haven't had a major breakthrough for, what, for a very, very long time. For a very long time, certainly not since the mid 70s. Um, there was an announcement a few um, weeks ago about the detection of gravitational waves rippling the uh, space time of the universe, which is very significant but this was really only an experimental confirmation of something that we've known about for a while. So in terms of true breakthroughs, we haven't had one for a very, very long time. Well, Mr. James Dean is here just because I like the look of it, and he reminded me of myself. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a joke, guys. <laughs> okay, so from now on, when there's a joke, I'll go like this. <laughs> so what is the big deal? What is the big deal? Um, <clears throat> why should you care? Why should we care? Um, so, so this is us. And just to give some sense of scale, well, there's the Earth and the Moon and the Sun, and of course, beyond that, the rest of the universe with the odd black hole thrown in. This scale is large. And everything that we think about in the universe, everything that captivates us about the universe, is at a scale that is very grand. But one of the reasons why I think we should care about quantum physics is that actually 
everything that we think we understand about the universe starts and ends with our understanding of the most fundamental aspects of the universe. And man's quest, mankind's quest to understand the universe around them, revolves around, first of all, looking at the observable, and then from that trying to deduce whether there are any fundamental particles that are not divisible. What is it that we're all made of? What are black holes made of? What is a sun made of? What's the universe made of? What is gravity? And quantum mechanics offers probably, I shouldn't say probably, offers up until now the only glimpse into that um, foundational aspect. And I have to say that in looking at uh, the literature, the popular literature around theoretical physics, we've yet to make the leap. There's lots and lots of literature that allow all of us to understand more about the huge majesty of the universe. When we try and find an equivalent literature about the very, very small, we stumble. And, of course, um, you probably can't read this, but a long, long time ago, the galaxy far away, well, everything we know about the universe, I'll, I'll, for anybody who wants, I'll send this presentation around afterwards. Um, everything we know in the universe, planets, people, stars, galaxies, gravity, matter, antimatter, energy, dark energy, all date from this cataclysmic event that we call the Big Bang. But then, the Big Bang, what was it? It was really just a single proton. What we think was a proton, it might have been something else, but it was a fundamental particle <coughs> that was infinitesimal in size. And in fractions of a fraction of a fraction of a second, it expanded and became the universe that we know, now know. So whatever we can understand about the infinitesimal will allow us to have a greater understanding about the universe itself. So that's one of the reasons why we ought to be interested. Um, before I move on, I also ought to say that um, we there's a counter-conversation that's not the subject of today's little journey, which is that we ought to know because it's beautiful. There are many people who would consider the study of quantum mechanics to be a very beautiful subject. The aesthetics of the underlying structures and the ways in which they're described mathematically have a very austere beauty about them. I mean, not so long ago, there was a, um, a, a, a quite, quite, quite an involved conversation around the world about you know, the most beautiful equation. And the winner, by some common consent, was the Dirac equation. And if those of you who are fortunate to go to Westminster Cathedral, um, there's a memorial to Dirac, and on his memorial stone is, um, is the Dirac equation. And it affects everything that we, we do, and everything that we could possibly do. And the beauty of that aspect of quantum physics is another reason why we might be um, interested in this particular subject. So I think that uh, we're not, don't worry, we're not going to go into the Dirac equation, although a little bit later on a colleague of mine will help me. So coming back to my talk and maybe getting a little bit into the teeth of it. So we talked earlier, I talked earlier about our quest to understand the world around us and that quest dates back really to the, to the dim, distant myths of recorded human history. So when we think about the milestones that allowed us to get to the sort of knowledge that we have today, and remember I said at the very beginning, we're standing on the shoulders of a great many giants, giants in the discovery of scientific knowledge. But our journey, um, at least in the form that it can be recorded and understood, um, probably goes back to the times of around five or 600 BC when somebody, all of us from school um, studies will understand and remember Pythagoras. Um, was he a mythical character or not is a debate for another time, but I think he did exist. Um, and I think there's sufficient evidence to suggest that um, the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the two other squares is actually something that he came up with as opposed to anybody else. But the fact is that that, that sort of dates the start of this modern journey. Um, it was very important, um, Lucretius, um, who came up with the idea of the swerve of the atom and indeterminacy. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. And the reason that's important 
is a continuing debate about free will versus determinism. Is everything a cause of what happened yesterday or the day before or the day before or not? Um, and then later on, of course, well, sorry, Archimedes, how can we forget Archimedes? Um, and when he went into his bath and the bath water flipped over and he started thinking about volumes and he was primarily a mathematician. But they were about the same time. There's probably slightly more doubt about Archimedes' um, bona fides um, than there are about Pythagoras's. But nevertheless, as far as we're concerned, he was real. Then we get on to slightly more um, easier to verify uh, giants, uh, Galileo. And I often use the analogy that if we're looking backwards and we were at cloud level, there would be some peaks, large mountains, that would be sticking up through the clouds. And of course, Galileo, well, these guys would be one of them. Maybe you haven't heard of Lucretius too often, but certainly Pythagoras and Archimedes. And then we have a long wait. It wasn't because there weren't any human beings thinking about this stuff. It's probably because through the Dark Ages, at least in Western Europe, there wasn't recorded history to tell us what they were thinking about. But we get to the time of Galileo, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and he takes up two objects of different <laughs> masses, different weights, and lo and behold what happens, you have a cannonball which is, I don't know, five pounds in weight or ten pounds in weight, and you have a smaller ball that is only one pound in weight, and he lets them go, and it's a counterintuitive thing for us because we're bounded by gravity here, but of course they all fall at the same rate. There's no difference in the way they fall. The only difference um, would be the air resistance. On YouTube, for those of you who are interested, there's a fantastic little uh, experiment that is shown, which is in a vacuum chamber, a feather and a cannonball. And you let them go together, and they fall at the same rate. And uh, Galileo's discoveries were groundbreaking, despite the best efforts of the Catholic Church at the time. Those of us who are Catholic, much to our great regret. Um, and uh, shortly after Galileo, in fact, the, the, I, if I'm not mistaken, Arthur will know, the same year that Galileo died, Newton was born. Thing, or, or within a year or two. And Newton, uh, what can you say about Newton, but um, the, the apple falling on his head, um, and he represents another major advance in our understanding of the world around us, and his capturing of the essence of gravity, apart from the fact that he's also, along with Leibniz, the <coughs> father of calculus, marks one of those great peaks that are coming up through, through the clouds. Um, but in our subject, that we're all going to be experts in after the next 20 minutes, um, the most fertile period was this amazing 40 or 50 years that spanned the end of the 19th century to the, well, to the First World War, I would say. Uh, you probably can't see this, but uh, I've written here, never before and never again will this happen. Um, and I think perhaps we're right. And people like Maxwell, Thompson, Rutherford, Max Planck, Poincaré, Heisenberg, Schrödinger, Dirac, uh, Einstein here in the middle. Um, yeah, that is Einstein. Yeah. Um, and, and this represented the coming together of um, an intellectual odyssey that has provided us with most of the understanding that we have today. Now, of course, these were great minds, but there was something else that happened at that time. Engineering advances allowed us to understand more and witness more about the smaller scales. So it wasn't by magic that these people all had the same milk or the same cup of tea and, uh, and they, 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 they became more aware. In fact, we're living at a similar time now. Engineering advances are allowing us to do things that we couldn't conceive of 15, 20 years ago. When these people were um, around, and particularly from about 1900 to about 1930, there were two things that happened that really made a difference. A hundred years prior, at the beginning of the 19th century, a very famous double slit experiment by Thomas Young, when he started looking at the nature of light. And the way he did his experiment was using sunlight and man-made slits. We're going to come back to the double slit experiment later because it tells us about the properties of light, the properties of particles of light, and the nature of quantum mechanics. But he didn't have the material that these people had. So by the time you get to Maxwell and Rutherford, 
it's a different age. They have access to engineering, which allowed them to look down at the infinitesimal, at things which are smaller than the naked eye could possibly see. And that's why there was a great and fertile time. Now, of course, Einstein is Einstein. He could have been any time, and he would have done whatever he's done. And Einstein's another one of these individuals whose work is ceaselessly fascinating. And he came up with the modern version of gravity. But actually, he was obsessed with quantum physics, the subject we're going to be talking about. I put my favourite on here, which was uh, Feynman, because he postdates that. So, we've talked about the infinitesimal. What do we mean? Let's put a bit of scale on this. So here we are. This is me. Sorry, I don't look like James Dean. Mm -hmm. And an apple. So we can all understand an apple. Well, there might be an apple outside, actually. So what are we really talking about? So an apple, maybe five centimeters across, four centimeters across. So how many apples would fill an Earth? So I've put a number here. It doesn't mean anything. It's two and a half with 24 zeros after it. Technically called a septillion. And that would make an Earth. So, lots of apples. And then you need lots of Earths to fill a sun. You over a million, a million and a half-ish Earths, and you more or less get a sun. But then what happens is where the sun is one of many such stars in our galaxy, and how many suns would fill out the Milky Way? More than the, by a factor of a billion, of they are Earths into the Sun, you'd have to have 10 with 36 zeros after it to get any sense of the scale of this particular galaxy. So many more times than there are apples that would fill the Earth are there suns that might fill the galaxy. Now current estimates keep on changing, but if you reckon there are 200 billion stars in the Milky Way, then you're probably in the right area. And of course, we don't know how many galaxies there are. And we're probably a medium-sized galaxy in midlife. <laughs> There's a very interesting uh, piece um, that's recently come up about just looking at how many planets there must be that have the same sort of atmospheric conditions uh, that we have, and it's certainly measured in billions. So <laughs> we're not unique by any stretch of the imagination, but this is not a cosmology lecture. So, uh, <laughs> so that gives you a sense of scale going outwards. Now let's go backwards. So first of all, how many atoms in a grain of salt? We can all figure out. So, Approximately 10 million grains of salt in an apple just gives you some idea. Um, you know, maybe it's 8 million, maybe it's 12 million, maybe it's small salt, maybe it's a big apple, but more or less there's uh, 10, million, 10 million atoms in a grain of salt. Uh, no, so 10, 10 million grains of salt in an apple. So how many atoms in a single grain of salt? So <laughs> Ignore the six, but something times 10 to the 23, which is um, 10 to the 24. So as many apples as there are in the Earth, there are atoms in a single grain of salt. There's actually more because you have to times 30 as well, but we'll ignore that. That's a lot of atoms in a grain of salt. And then, we're not done yet. The thing that we're interested in is the electron, or the photon. How many electrons, or how big or small is the electron compared to the atom? Now, a couple of ways of looking at this. Um, and uh, this one I had to, had to write down because I wasn't going to remember it. What slide are we on? Does anybody know? Yeah, okay, great. So, um, let's go to the next slide and we'll come back to that. Let's get our mind around an atom. An atom is largely space. There's, it, 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 it's really quite empty. So if you could think of our solar system, 
as having only one star in it, and where we might imagine Pluto is, there might be a little thing floating around. Well, that's kind of, and everything else is empty, or at least empty in as far as our minds, for today's purposes, can conceive, because there's no such thing as empty, at least not in cosmological terms. That's the sort of the magnitude. What I mean by that, that's the nucleus. Now, the nucleus itself is made up of protons and neutrons, and we'll come back to that in a second. But if that were the center of the electro, uh, of the atom, then the real-life analogy is if that were a golf ball, then the outer boundary of the atom would be a whole kilometer away. And everything else, if it was a golf ball, then everything else is space. <coughs> We are talking about very small scales here. But the relative size is something to bear in mind. And of all the things <coughs> you've heard, this is your marker. So four or five times during this talk, I'm going to ask you to put a marker up here to remember, and then we're going to come back to it. So that's your first marker. Now, we're not even going to be talking about the nucleus. We're going to be talking about the electron. And one of the constituents of the nucleus is the, I've chosen the neutron, is 2,000 times bigger than the electron. So we go smaller still. Hmm. Um, there's a neat way of, 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 of doing this. I never remember it, so I had to write it down. So, uh, and this is uh, courtesy of Dickie Feynman. So imagine a drop of water. If you look at a single drop of water, and you put it on here, say, say, say it's a big drop, let's say it's a quarter of an inch across, we're, we're still all imperial inches in yards here. If you looked at it, there's no way, of course, that you could see any of the atoms. So what would you have to do? If you were to magnify it 2,000 times, so the same magnitude of difference between the electron and the neutron, if you magnified that 2,000 times, the quarter of an inch um, drop of water would be 40 feet. So it would be from here to across the road where that building is. Right? So that's how big it would be a giant drop of water. And at that size, what could you see? You still couldn't see atoms. Now you'd look into them and you'd see football or basketball shaped things floating around. And these would be the bacteria. And it wouldn't be teeming with bacteria because in a drop of water there'd be many, but not that many. What would you have to do? You'd have to magnify that and expand it another 2,000 times. At which point that drop of water is, anybody here quick on their feet, 15 miles. I, I didn't know, but I had to write it down as well. 50, 50, so your drop of water is now 15 miles long. So 15 miles long and 13 miles up there. At that point, at that point, could you see an atom? Well, of course the answer is no. You'd have to <laughs> multiply that another 250 times. And at that point, what would you see? You still wouldn't see atoms. But what you would see at that point is a beach ball, which would be a single molecule of oxygen with a couple of footballs hanging out, which would be the hydrogen. Uh, forgive me for being very approximate in these, in, in, in these scales. So that's how small we have to be. And really just to write <coughs> that little excursion up, you'd have to <coughs> magnify your, we started off with the apple, a hundred million times. Now, even that is outside of our normal concept. We don't know what it means to magnify something a hundred million times. I just told you about magnifying a, uh, or enlarging a drop of water 2,000 times, then another 2,000 times. That's nothing like a hundred million. So we're talking about rather large scales just in order to get our mind around it. Well, um, okay, let's skip that one. The point, therefore, is that there's a, there's a sort of a, this has become normal mythology, and I, I, I make no apology for using it, but our minds 
first of all, it's easier for us to grasp the big because we can look out and we can see it. But even at that stage, we kind of start having problems when you get beyond a couple of hundred kilometers. You know, we know what the Grand Canyon is. If we've seen it, we still go, oh. you know, these are the limits of our human comprehension. And then going back the other way, we might, you know, we all know what a grain of salt is. And so we can see it and touch it and feel it. So one of the difficulties about quantum physics apart from the fact that it's a relatively dense subject in terms of its language, is the fact that our concepts, when we get to those levels, just aren't designed to appreci appreciate anything intuitively. So that's your second marker. And what should happen, we all know when, these, uh, when we're looking at the counterintuitive, is we relax. We allow things into ourselves that are not normal. So that's what I'm going to ask you to do for the last bit of this talk, because I'm going to walk you through some of the, the key precepts. And as I walk you through them, just just don't fight it. Right? Just don't fight it. And, and, and especially, it can't be done. That's not allowed in here. Right? It can't be done is not allowed in this room for the next 15 minutes. Um, oh, well this is, um, I just like the photograph. It's a freely available on the internet. But um, what I was going to say is that, of course, well that's the Milky Way. Do you know where that is? That's in the Atacama Desert in um, northern Chile. And it's the radio telescope that the European <coughs> Space Research Centre has uh, partially sponsored as well. Um, and it's just to give us a sense um, of the fact that, you know, the, the big and the grand is much more easily accessible to us. Now then, what are we going to talk about? So, on this gentle walk through quantum physics, we're going to um, visit three or four concepts in order to equip us with that counterintuitive understanding uh, that gives us a base. We're going to talk about something uh, referred to as a wave and a particle duality. And by the way, I did all of these. <laughs> I could find a presentation to do it. Uh, entanglement. Um, superposition and then uncertainty. These are four concepts that you will hear a lot about uh, and in fact you probably already have heard a lot about when people talk to you about quantum physics or uh, quantum mechanics. And our first one um, is wave particle duality. And what that means is that in the world of the very small things are both particle-like or point-like and wave-like. At that point, we need to take a little bit of a detour. So, in normal life, there's me in normal <coughs> life. If I, um, yeah, the nap will be. Okay, no, no, we don't need that. We need this. So, um, so I go like this, and he catches it. That is a normal tra trajectory. We don't think twice about it. Ah, oh, good, good, good. Thank you. We only need it once more. Um, so I'll do that again. For a <laughs> so, so when we drop a ball or an apple, it has a trajectory. And that trajectory isn't an accident. There are a lot of forces that go into it, but we, we understand gravity. And force, of course, how, how quickly we throw it or how hard we throw it. But we understand that, and that's a particle, that's a point-like object, that, that is a single thing that we can conceive of and understand and we can follow it. And we, in normal mechanics, in physics, we can measure all of that very easily. And think about certainty here. You know, if I park my car outside, unless the city of Westminster dislikes it or in a bad place, I'll come back Maybe if I park it at 4 o'clock, I come back at 6 o'clock and the car's still there. It hasn't disappeared. It hasn't suddenly gone somewhere else. Unless a force is applied to it, for example, the guy that comes and picks it up, it's going to stay there. So these are certainties in the world around <coughs> us. Now, waves, the different kinds of waves, they're sound waves, my wife's here today, so I do love you, and she heard it, but so did the rest of you, and the reason she heard it is that these waves propagate out of my mouth into the air around, and they go into your ears, and you interpret them, and we take that for granted. So that's a 
pretty typical kind of wave. The remarkable thing about that is we take it for granted because we can't see it. But it, it, is a, it is wave, sound is a wave. Uh, there are other waves that we can see, so when a ship, that is a boat by the way, going through the water and, uh, and these are the waves. Now we can see those waves, and those waves are caused by motion, by force, and there's a law. There's, even if we didn't see this photograph, if I provided somebody as smart as Eddie here with the basic ingredients, he could tell you how far apart those ripples were and at what point they would cease being noticeable, i.e. they would flatten out. And there's a fish that's come up out of the water here and it slaps in to the water and that's a different kind of force than the force that's applied by the barrel. But we know all these things. We understand them, we don't think about them, very much, and that's a wave. So we've talked about a particle, we've talked about a wave. But in quantum physics, an electron, now going back to something which we, and, and I crave the forgiveness of the two specialists in this room, um, we're going to skip a little bit here, but in when we talk about wave-particle duality, something like an electron is both a particle and a wave in terms of what it exhibits as qualities at the same time. So it would be a bit like this sound that I might make in this room being heard only by Mara. So you're not muffled, I haven't put any earplugs on you, but the rough analogy would be the equivalent of me speaking normally in all these waves deciding not to go to your ears, but to coalesce and only become point-like in Mara's ears. Or, it would be, remember the fish coming up out of the water and the waves splashing, all the waves, instead of going like that, they suddenly decide, right, we're just going to go over here to Professor Gibson, and they go that way. Well, of course, that doesn't happen and can't happen. But in quantum physics, it does. That's the equivalent. Now, what... Um, this is one of the most... Um, this phenomenon, wave particle duality, is one of the most um, experimentally proven. Um, I think, Elizabeth, no, it's fine if you're dying a death, just, no, yeah, yeah, just put the aircon on. Yeah, does anybody know how to put it on? Oh, is it? All right, okay. Okay, in which case, put the thing down so that the sun doesn't come out on the back of you, that's fine. Okay, uh, this is the bit where we will edit. <laughs> Yeah, as well as the bit when I did the thing, and I'm not there. Right, so now, wave-particle duality is probably one of the most experimentally proven phenomena um, within quantum physics. Um, I'm not going to do the experiment here, but broadly speaking, um, the experiment um, uh, was first, as far as we know, um, um, observed by uh, Thomas Young. That was at the, in 1801, uh, the beginning of the 19th century. And he used sunlight. We now are much more sophisticated. We can use lasers. We can actually do this to the point where we generate single photons. Uh, a photon is the most fundamental particle of light. So light, which is energy, all around us can be decomposed down to a single photon. And what happens is that when light goes through, um, these are two slits, they interfere with each other and they create a pattern on the board behind which is very wave-like. There's nothing that's very obviously disconcerting about that. However, if instead of shooting waves, of light, so a torchlight, we send individual photons. So this, let's imagine this is a photon. And I threw this and I was really, really good as a baseball player, one Peter. And the slit was over there and it went through the slit on that wall. What you would imagine is that it would go through and it would hit at one point. Now a few of them might bounce around and it might hit there, it might hit here, but by and large you'd expect that the pattern that it would make on the screen at the back would be because it's a single particle. Remember, there are laws. You ready? When you do that, it goes over there and it ends up in its hands. Well, that doesn't happen to photons. Because the minute you start, and I'm not going to go into observability, 
But the minute we start tracking what happens, it becomes wave-like again. When we don't track what happens, it concentrates point-like. Now, this experiment, in many different ways, at many different times, has been done again and again and again. Most universities probably are doing it every single day for their first or second year. Do you do it first or second year physics? Uh, second year. Second year physics at Cambridge, which probably means postgraduate Oxford. It's um, <laughs> 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 unfair on Eddie. <laughs> um, but, but this is very, very well done. Now, what actually this means, I, now I thought long and hard before trying to bring this back to this crowd, and I came up with this. Imagine that it's raining, and imagine there's lots of raindrops coming down, and untold numbers of raindrops, and within one of these raindrops, there's a speck of dust. <coughs> so you've got a rainy day, and let's say we're up in, I don't know, we're up in, um, on the Pennines, on the Moors, up in Lancashire, and so there's lots of rain, there's lots of raindrops, and on one of them there is um, a piece of dust. So when that raindrop there that's got the dust lands, that's my head, when it lands on my head here, this raindrop dissipates. Now, it doesn't evaporate into nothing, it still has that little piece of dust in it, that mite of dust. So where on my head, which is clean shaven, so there's no hair, you know, it's a fashion choice, then, um, then <laughs> if we were trying to find it, if, if, I, if we were saying, well, where is she? Well, what we would do is we would start over here, and we'd ride the waves, and eventually we'd find it. Now, you can, convert that into this. So if this is your, if this is the distribution of the water, and this is the likelihood of finding it, the greatest likelihood is up here, with a lot of water, and the lowest likelihood is down here. I know it's not quite that simple. But that helps you understand <coughs> one of the aspects that we're now going to go into once you've understood wave particle duality. In the real world, and even at drops of rain and mites of dust, this is the big world, this is easy. In the quantum world, trying to figure out where this mite of dust is, is entirely probabilistic. It is not deterministic. Now, this is a second marker I'm going to ask you to make. So the first marker you've already made, this is a second marker. And the three concepts that we're going to talk about now should hopefully help you understand what this actually means. Are we okay? Should we carry on? We have no choice. So the next aspect of quantum physics that we will talk about is uncertainty. Normally you don't talk about uncertainty in quantum physics unless you append it with the name Heisenberg. And I think you're in front of that camera. You're, yeah, there you go. Um, um, I'm not necessarily going to go to, well, I'm not going to go at all into the underlying mechanics, but um, what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says is that there are two qualities, for example, that any small fundamental particle can exhibit. One is where is it, and the second is its momentum or the velocity of the direction that it's going in. So remember that little mite of dust which we've converted into a fundamental particle what Heisenberg tells us and what the uncertainty principle tells us is that we can know where it is, but we can't know its momentum, or we can know its momentum, but we can't know where it is. Now, there's a very bad reproduction of his equation up there that you can ignore for a second, but the Heisenberg principle, which is the position and the momentum, is always greater than or equal to um, uh, little Planck over 2 enshrines that principle. So in the principle of quantum mechanics, all we need to know for today is that you can only know one of the two things. Now for me and my the example of the car, you know where the car is and you know how fast or how slow it's going. 
you know where I am, you can see me, I can be measured. At the quantum level, you can either know one and not the other. Grasped? Very, that was an easy one. Why is that the case? Why is it that we can't do that? Well, of course, the reason is that a typical wave, well, not typical, the wavelength of light, monochromatic light, before Eddie picks me up on it, but for the rest of us, light has a certain wavelength, which happens to be 5 to 10 to the minus 7, so 7 zeros after the 10, and then a, a decimal point above it, so very, very small, very, very, very small. But of course, we've already known that protons, ten, so ten, well, it's got a 7 there, it's got a 15 there, that means this is smaller, not bigger. And that's got an 18 there, so that's smaller still. So electrons and protons are many times smaller. The proton is 100 million times smaller than the wavelength. Now, why is that important? It's important because unless you've got a, something like that measures and can capture, you can't see it. So that's really all there is to it. Nothing complicated whatsoever. So the next time anybody says to you, Heisenberg's uncertainty, you're like, what the hell are you? You're just talking about uncertainty. And that's the reason why. It really is as simple as that. Now, like everything else in life, it gets a bit more complicated if you wanted to, but that's about as simple. You're, to, you're objecting, Charles. <laughs> 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 Okay, he's objecting. <laughs> <laughs> the reason he's objecting, of course, is that the instruments that we use or could use to observe something which use light are themselves an intrusion into the system. And so they affect the uncertainty. And we, we, we should say that, but we've decided to keep this a gentle introduction for the curious... Um, Generalist. Is that what we said? Yeah. yeah. So we're not going to bother ourselves with these complications. So that's that. Second of the three, or th uh, yeah, second of the three, entanglement. So you've probably all heard of entanglement because <coughs> this is, well, many people have said many things about entanglement, but John Preskill, who is uh, perhaps the greatest of the living theoretical physicists, would you say? Living yeah. physicists? Yes. And in that era for sure. Are we agreeing, Eddie? And yeah? So he says it's what holds space together. Entanglement is fundamentally important and um, is also has been described as the key that unlocks the universe. It was also um, something which puzzled Einstein. We're going to come to Einstein in a minute because he rebelled against the idea of um, entanglement. So in the classical world, when we say that we know about something, so for example, there's a car, it's a Rolls Royce. When we say we know all there is to know about Rolls Royce, it means you know about the wheels, you know about the engine, that's the engine, steering wheel, the carburetor, the seat belt, the door, the wipers. We know not only what it means to be a car, but we know all about every constituent of the car. In quantum physics, I'm afraid, when we say we know something about an, ent an entangled system, we know all there is to know about the system, but we don't know the components. Now, what does that mean? It's, a bit, it's equivalent to saying, oh, well, I know everything there is to know about the car, but the minute you show me a carburetor, I'm like, what's that? That's the real world equivalent. Now, why is that the case and what does it mean? So, we're going to do who's got a coin? A coin, two coins for the want of the kingdom. Two coins. Does nobody have any money anymore? <laughs> well, it's really very sad. <laughs> All these bankers in here, and we haven't got any money. Lofton, you here can't speak. Wait, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Right. Thank you, a scientist. We have another one. No, no. <laughs> oh. Oh. Right, okay, we'll make do with this. So, the great thought experiment, and again, we're going to 
unmuddle this so that whenever anybody talks to you about entanglement from now on, you're going to know all there is to know about it. <coughs> let's do the classical world, and let's um, use two rather good-looking people for this experiment, because you're on camera. Alenka, take this. Now you take that. Now, if we separated Alenka from Meng, but the only condition of separation was that they could look at the coin, and if that's is that a head? Then that has to be a tail. Is that a tail? Right. And if those were the only conditions that existed, and we packed you off in a spaceship, and we sent you to the outer reaches of the universe, no matter what, if you looked at your coin, as long as you hadn't flipped it, it would be a head. And you would know that as long as she hasn't flipped hers, it's a tail. Right? There's no causality, you're not causing it to be a tail, but you know it's a tail. So that's real life. So these two objects are not entangled, these two people are not entangled, these two coins are not entangled, that's normal life, correct? However, what if we did the same experiment, and you can pick up the coin please, Lenka, and what we said was that Elenka will flip her coin when she gets to... 14 billion light years away, which is the age of, as far as we can tell, our galaxy, or 15 billion, and flip it. Are you able to flip it? And then, what is it? Ten. When she flips it 14 billion light years away, for any information about the state of her coin, which is then tail, to get to men would take 14 billion light years, which in real years is a lot of years. At that point, automatically, without anything at all, your coin would have to be ahead. It would have to be the opposite. At the point she flips it, not at the point that the information gets to you, it becomes tail. So it's not that you went there with a predetermined coin, but when you got there, you flipped it. Flipping it and then looking at it causes this to be a mistake. That, ladies and gentlemen, is entanglement. Now, we can get very complicated about this if we really want to, and this is an attempt to go the next level beyond coins, but ultimately, fundamental particles, especially fermions, have things called spins, and you can have spins which also are directionally oriented, and no matter what, when you have two particles that are entangled, and you're on Earth, and here's where Alenka was, at the outer edge of the universe, Quality, and in this case the observable quality was the, um, the heads of the tails, of one immediately affects the other. Now a lot of people have rebelled against this idea philosophically. Einstein said that this was not possible, there must be some secret communication or there must be some unknown value that we, don't, we haven't yet encountered which explains this difference. Um, he wrote a paper in 1935, which was the einstein podolsky rosen paper, which at least four of you in this room are familiar with. Charles is nodding as well, there's five of you. And that <laughs> is a, a very great paper. And it, it wasn't until the mid-1960s when an Osterman by the name of Bell um, did an experiment um, which um, proved once and for all um, Bell's inequality experiment that actually this is correct, it, this entanglement does exist and it's proven and Bell's inequality and Bell's experiment have, has been tried again and again and again and in fact separately in the business that we're involved in quantum computing, Bell's inequalities are a great tool um, in looking at the way in which algorithms are designed and implemented for certain quantum procedures. So entanglement is important in many, many, many different areas. Now, we're actually going to stop there on entanglement. So you all now know about uncertainty. Well, you know, all know about wave-particle duality. You know about uncertainty. And you now know about entanglement. And the last of the holy grails is something called superposition. Um, I have, to, by the way, before we get on to superposition, I should say that on the issue of entanglement, a couple of other points which then become um, topics of great interest and debate, particularly for me, and one of them is free will. So do we have free will or 
is the world around is deterministic, and that's linked in many respects to, 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 to entanglement as well, but we won't go into that. Superposition. Now, um, just as in uncertainty, you can't talk about uncertainty unless people tell you about somebody called Heisenberg. Um, you can't talk about superposition in quantum physics or physics without somebody telling you about Schrodinger. Um, this particular aspect I left to the end because it is the most abused in the sense of badly explained uh, qualities of um, quantum physics. It is a fundamental part of quantum physics and it is not the same of entanglement. So uh, to give you a sense of what uncertainty is, before we go back to this diagram, it's all of you who know me know that I never remember anybody's name. So let's say that I saw Pete coming up and he was you know, 20 meters away and I was like, oh, is, he, is it Peter, is it Paul, or is it Michael? I think it's Peter, but it might be Paul, or it might be Michael. And the, and the closer you get, and then the minute you open your gob and say something, I'm like, oh, Peter. So that period of uncertainty, when there was like a 50% chance that you were going to be a Peter, but there's a 20% chance you were Paul, and a 30% chance you were a Michael. Now, clearly, you weren't. You were always Peter. But it's the best analogy that's easy to understand that I can provide to all of you about the principle of uncertainty. <coughs> now, being slightly more rigorous, um, what um, the uncertainty principle really talks about is the collapse of something called the wave function. Ignore that, but Schrodinger came up with this beautiful equation which uh, allows people to measure um, with determinancy, things which are actually not measurable, um, which is a wave function at the infinitesimal level. And he came up with his thought experiment, which was the famous Schrodinger's cat. Have you all heard about Schrodinger's cat or not? You must have heard of it, yeah. yeah. So this is, um, well, for those of us that haven't, we're about to, to, to hear about it. So, so first the thought experiment, and then why it's quite often badly explained. So Schrodinger said, it's a bit uncertainty, it's a bit like putting a cat in a box. So I've got this box here, cardboard box, airtight, and I open it up and I put the cat in it, and at the same time there's this vial of noxious poisonous gas that's, that's here, and the top of that will either open and release the poison or remain closed depending upon what he described as radioactive decay, the rate of decay. Let's forget about radioactive decay. Let's assume that there's a, part, a particle here. And whether or not it's released from its host, which might be a lump of metal, because metals are made out of particle, is indeterminate. It could happen in one second, or it could happen in an hour. And whether or not it happens, this poison will be released, and the cat will die. So when you close the system up, and you shut the door on this, you we can't see what's inside. Well, actually, we also don't know the rate at which that um, atom will be released, so it's indeterminate, which means actually the cat's kind of dead and alive at the same time. And you can only find out whether it's dead or alive when you open the box. Schrodinger's approach to this was to use the thought experiment to highlight why, in the non infinitesimal world, in the real world, because the cat is not a quantum object. It's either alive, or dying, or dead. Why uncertainty was such a puzzling consequence? He didn't say that the cat is alive or dead. And unfortunately, most times when you go and look at this particular principle online, it, it is badly explained. But I would encourage you to ignore the cat and think of this as a fundamental particle has many different aspects to its behavior. The quality that we've chosen to display is something called spin up or spin down. So here's a particle, and it's either spinning up or it's spinning down. Until we measure what it is, measure means look, observe, we just won't know. But actually, what we find in quantum physics is that is every state of up and down and everything in, bet in between at the same time. Now, this is a very, very hard concept to grasp, but it is fundamental to quantum physics. So my suggestion, and I left this till the last 
of the three qualities is to think about it as we need that big coin again. So this coin is a two-state system. Imagine. It's either a, a tail or a head. It is only a tail or a head. However, imagine that when I go like that, and you saw that it was spinning, it was kind of neither up nor down, was it? It was everything. So imagine that a fundamental particle is in a constant, ever-present state of spinning, and it's neither up nor down, until the point when you capture it and you observe it, it then fixes the state. That's probably out as much as we need to know about superposition. <coughs> Last two minutes, um, things for you to, if you're particularly interested, learn a bit more. We didn't talk about uh, the standard model um, uh, 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 of particle physics, what things are made up of, and electrons and muons, and the quarks are up here, the leptons are here, the force carriers, the, 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 the gauge bosons are here, and here's Higgs boson. So this is, you know, like in chemistry, you have a table of, ele of the elements. This is the equivalent of what we've just talked about. Um, there, are, there are hundreds of particles, don't worry. But this is the so-called standard model. So if you are interested to learn a bit more, um, then I would say that this is a, a good place to start, to learn about the individual properties. There's lots of accessible material there. And of course, um, we didn't talk about the forces. We all know about gravity. Gravity is a big force um, because we know about it. You don't jump up like that, and so that's gravity. I mean, me coming down is gravity. Me going up is force. Me going down is gravity. Um, and if I was you, I'd have hit my head against the wall. The other forces that, um, that govern the world are the so-called strong force, um, which hold together the nucleus of an atom. Why does an atom, um, the constituents of an atom, not come away? And that has a force of, shall we say, one. And it's got a very small range. It only acts in a small area. And then you have the weak force, which is the so-called beta decay. All things decay. There's entropy in everything. And the weak force uh, governs that um, rate of decay. And that's another very... So if that has a, um, a force of 1, this is a very weak force. It's 10 to the minus 6. So that's 6 zeros after the 1. So if I, so one, if I did 0 0.00000, that's how that force um, compares. Then there's the electromagnetic force that we all know about, electricity, magnetism, um, which is also weaker than the strong force, but it has an infinite range. Um, light is a photoelectric effect, and we all know about gravity. There might be a fifth force, we haven't discovered it yet, and um, the, great, the great quest for humanity is the laws of gravity are not the same as the laws of the strong, the weak, and the electromagnetic force. We can go back to this. This is governed by the three forces that are the strong, the electromagnetic, and the weak, but gravity only acts on things which are much bigger. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the end. <laughs>
Usma. Usma asked a question, which was, what are the practical applications of quantum physics? Well, why don't we have two goals at answering this? Um, and so I'll give you one very simple one. So um, when we um, think of ourselves, we're composite units, and everything that governs our composition is a result of these basic laws. Now, it's very hard to reconcile that, but the practical application is that you're thinking and you're here and you're seeing me as well. Um, quantum mechanics is behind the activities of the sun. So the sun itself is a big nuclear um, oven, for the want of a better word. But the laws that govern what um, happens at those very high temperatures, and what converts that energy into, as far as we're concerned, light, and how that light then travels to us, and what that light then does, that, that, that's, that's quantum physics. But any, well, actually, the, teacher, the Cambridge teachers, any other practical applications? Um, actually, everything electronic works because of quantum physics. So quantum physics is a theory that small things come in small pieces. So as Ilya said, light comes in quants of light, which are called photons. And actually, when you look at that screen, the reason why you see a picture is because of quantum physics, because there are little electrodes which stimulate photons which are emitted. <laughs>